right. Hello and welcome to the Marketing 101 for Small Business Owners podcast. I'm your host, Philippa Channer. I'm a content marketing strategist and I'm happy you guys are here with us today. And I'm also happy today that I have a special guest. I don't know if you saw, but for the month of July, I'm doing nothing but guest posts because I know you guys are probably tired of hearing me talk all the time and hearing other experts are going to really enrich your life and help your business grow. So today I have with me Eric Holzclaw. He's going to bring us some of the top mistakes that a lot of business owners make when it comes to marketing and how we can fix them. So Eric, please introduce yourself and let us know how you got into marketing and what brings you here today. So I'm Eric Holtzkall. I'm the chief strategist of a company called Liger. We're a B2B marketing firm. Uh, I like to tell people I'm a recovering technologist. So I started my early career running development shops. I owned a research company for a period of time, and then I accidentally started Liger. <laughs> and so Liger is basically a combination, uh, well, marketing nowadays is a combination of technology and understanding your user. And so yes. that background for me works really well. And because we're in the B2B space, I've also done so much work kind of working with B2B companies and they don't necessarily understand marketing in the same way B2C does. Like a B2C mm -hmm. brand knows they have to do marketing. That's the only way they're going to attract customers. B2B companies often will ignore it. It's like one of the last things that they kind of think about. So it's a, it's, it's a fun little space to live in. So it's a good combination of all the things I've done in my past. Yes. I love that accidental starting a business. <laughs> I would yeah. love to hear more about that, like just how that journey came into like going from, like you're saying, going from a totally different space into marketing, starting a business. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> well, the, the short story is when I sold my business in 2012, I was never going to start another one. And I started doing operational work for companies. And as part of that, they would ask me to also run their marketing department. And so I was running like four or five different companies' marketing departments. Now I was had cleaned up their operations, but they still had me running marketing. And so yeah. I have a, a person who's worked for me for 10 or 11 years. And I was about to sign another one. And she's like, Eric, if you sign another one, you just like have six or seven jobs. This is ridiculous. And so I merged my business with another that did the execution piece to form Liger because Liger is a lion and a tiger combined. It's also based on the movie Napoleon Dynamite, if you've ever heard of it. So it's his yes. favorite animal. And so yes. uh, we ended up founding Liger around that principle and uh, found our niche. We work a lot with companies that either do M&A, so buying other companies in that kind of B2B space. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what happened. So I, I took something that was a, supposed to be a consultancy and turned it into a real business. <laughs> that's perfect, and, and I, I love that just that journey because that's a lot. A lot of times, that's how small businesses get started. It's yeah. it's a passion or something that they're already doing that they wanted to take the next step and just and they were bold enough and brave enough to take the next step and do it on their own. So I love well, it. And a good point about that too is. I was making money at doing it and then turned it into a business. A lot of people are like, oh, I need to start a business and then I can make money. And it's like, no, go make money. And then you can figure out what the business is as you start to make money on the back end. So yes. often companies get kind of caught up. And I know we're going to talk today about five marketing mistakes that companies make. Mm -hmm. That yep. is one of them. Like, yes, okay. you need to have a logo. Yes, you need to think about all those things. But the first thing you need to do is go sell a thing. And yes. if you can sell that thing, then you need to figure out how you're going to take it to market. Because as you sell it, you'll learn a little bit about who you are as a company, what your logo might need to look like, how it needs to stand. So yeah. don't spend so much money at the very beginning. You know, Everybody loves a business card. They love a logo. They love that whole process. But I see so many companies overspend in that category to begin with, yep. thinking that marketing is, oh, I have a brand. Yes. That's important. Yep. But like first and foremost generate some money. And if you can generate yep. some money, then we can figure out how to put the marketing on top of it. So, okay, well, since we already got to that point, then I, my question for that along that line is, is, do you help businesses with that research to find out is their product or their service even marketable in their area and figuring so, out if it's worth it? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens to us is companies come to us when they are having some type of problem. So they've either bought another business, they're not getting the sales that they expected. And so part of our process is we always look at the business first to determine the marketing. So we consider like, where is the business? What are the macro and micro trends impacting it? Where is it headed in the next two years? And then we can decide what kind of marketing to put on top of it. And part of that process may be that they need to reconfigure their business. I was working with a company a couple months ago and I don't think they liked my answer because the way they wanted to position themselves compared to how they really showed up in the world were very different. 
And so in order for them to do this new kind of marketing approach they were thinking of, they were going to have to fundamentally change the way they hired people, the way they structured that business and thought about it. And they just wanted me to slap a nice new logo and tagline on top of the business and it'd be different. We've all been in those places that are inauthentic to their brand and we know it, right? Like it's like when somebody tries to steal something from somebody else, you're like, that's not your thing. <laughs> yeah, yep. And so it's nice, but it's not you. Yeah. And regrettably, I'm at the point in my career where I like just tell people things and I'm okay if they don't like it and they're just going to move on. And that's, that's what we decided is like, yeah, well, I mean, I can't, I can't pitch this the way that you're ex- expecting unless you can make these other changes to the business. And if you're not going to, I'm not going to be successful with marketing the business. So yeah, go get another company that's willing to take your money and turn give you a cool new brand. But having a cool new brand doesn't mean that it's it representative of what your company actually does. And and I hope uh, you know small businesses especially see the value in you taking that stance because that it shows that you really care about their development and not just making money, and and you know and pushing out marketing that's not going to be effective for them. But you and, I, you and I both know as, as small business people that when you get that client that's not ideal, it's just painful on both sides, right? Like you're trying to yes. get them to do the thing that you want them to do. You're not even sure why they hired you, you know, like all that kind of stuff. And life's too short. There's too much work out there. Just like figure out who it is and then go after that ideal client and make sure you sort of really pinpoint in on those individuals. That's going to be yes. how you scale your business well. A few, oh my goodness, it would say like last year sometime, it was the first time I, I ran to the next, the other room to my husband in his office. And I was like, they finally fired me. <laughs> so like, I had one of those clients where I was just like, I didn't want to make the step because it was yeah. good money, but it was, yeah. I just yeah. knew what they wanted me to do wasn't the right thing. And it was just uncomfortable. And yeah, that weird it is hard to walk away. From, yeah, when you're getting the good money, but at the same time, when you look back on it, you're like, "Was I getting the good money, or was it really exactly, just yes. preventing me from doing something else?" Right? Yes, yes. So. I looked. I looked at it as an opportunity. That yes, the money I was making was probably about three times what I would do with my other clients. Yeah. Now I have the t- the capacity to take on three clients and fill that gap, and that's what I did. It took me like maybe two months, but I was able to fill that gap quickly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Making making wise business mistake mistake or making wise business choices, not yeah. on how much money it is, but is it really practical for your business? I love Absolutely. it. Yep. Now, tell me about another uh, marketing mistake you find that people do often. So the first one's around brand and like that's not the end all be all. The second is they spend way too much time trying to build like the perfect website. And typically mm-hmm. they try to build the website as a catalog, right? So like they're... Yeah. Um, and the website, the second you stand it up, Google may pay attention to it for a hot minute, but unless you're doing all the other things, then it's not going to work for you. So, so, yeah. so get out of the way of that website. It doesn't need to be per- perfect. You need to get it up there. Progress. Right. Yes. And you know, it's your best brochure. Yes, it's important, but honestly, in the buyer journey, it's one of the last places your buyer goes to. I have clients mm-hmm. who I think literally have never been to my website, Like they learned about our business through referral or you know, content that I put out or something else. So I can't overwork that component, even though everybody's like so focused on it. So I see a lot of businesses like wasting a lot of time and cycles on, oh, the best logo, da, 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 number one. Number two, now we got to have this website and it's got to be perfect and whatever. Yeah. No, doesn't need to be perfect. You just need to have one. You need to have one and it needs to, and it's going to evolve over time. You can't think of it as a completed thing. So it's not like printing a brochure, you know, you're going to make changes to it. You're going to change your services, get it up there, get it going and go make some money. (laughs) So, (laughs) so number two, spending way too much time trying to build the perfect website. Would you put on there, I mean, this is kind of the branding and the website, but I think there's a lot of companies who, like you're saying, go make the money first and then invest on making things perfect and better. Um, One of the things I see that I try to encourage small business to get over is if they don't have their domain yet or have purchased the websites to have their domain, so it's not, you know, Wix.com or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I try to tell them like that doesn't, in the long run, that doesn't matter. Right. Just as long yeah. as you have a website that people can get the basic information and what they need to know to move forward. Yeah. If it's not your URL yet, don't worry about it. But the, you know, but a lot of people still want like, I don't want that other name in my URL. 
Right. Do you find that to be an issue too? Well, I URLs used to be way more important, right? Like having the .com yeah. domain, all those kind of things. But if you do everything correctly in the third category I'm going to talk about, then the domain doesn't okay. matter. So, okay. And in the third category, this is going to be all about what your business does. So you have to be creating content. You have to have the right content strategy. You have to think about what your keywords are. That website, the second it stands up, unless you've got things that are drawing people in, educating them, telling them what you do, all those kind of things, you might as well not do it. So the third problem is that people think, I build a, web, I build a brand, I set up a website, and then I don't have to do anything else. No, mm-hmm. it just began. The, the yeah. beginning of your journey is now here. And so having yeah. a very nice content strategy, which then means I don't really need to know what your domain is because I'm going to come into you through side doors. Like I, I yeah. think if somebody comes in through your homepage, they're probably lost. Like if I go to your homepage, I don't know where I'm going. If I'm yeah. coming in through content, it's kind of like what should happen to me every time I go to Home Depot, just drop me on the aisle because I don't know anything about Home Depot. So like, please take yeah. me to the aisle that has the thing I want on it. And so your content becomes the magnet that pulls people through, you know, and you should be willing to give away all of your secrets. And so yeah. my thought on that, your know, company's like, oh, we can't give that away because then what if they go start their own business? I'm like, well, then you don't really have a business, right? Like you want to make sure yeah. that they understand how hard it is, how important it is to work with an expert and all of your content is what drives that. So yeah. companies that don't do anything in the content category, if you don't have a blog, a place that you're sort of constantly talking to your audience, then that's mistake number three. Yes. I, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Cause I, one of the things is, yeah, co- creating consistent content, getting people to understand that the way people find you is the content you're putting out. If you're providing valuable information, that's what they're going to find. And they're probably going to find it on Facebook because you're sharing it on Facebook or LinkedIn but they're not, they're not going to your website and seeing, yeah. oh, what's this blog? You know, what's their latest blog? Like nobody does that anymore. I mean, right. Unless yeah. you're like a storyteller, you're writing short stories that people are following a specific journey with you. No, otherwise they're doing a Google search or they're following your social media and they see you wrote about something that they're interested in and they clicked on it. So yes. hopefully you're writing content that they're interested in <laughs> to make yes. them want to click. Absolutely. And so... That's mistake number four. Oh, you and I, it's like we okay. practice this. Stage some mistake yes. number four is that I'm not using social media, not using it effectively. And what I see companies yeah. do with content is they follow. So the rule for content creation should be 20% creation, 80% promotion. And companies are always doing 80% creation and 20% promotion. You spend all this time writing this blog, building this white paper, doing this case study, having a podcast with someone, and you never speak of it again. And it's yep. like... How you hope people, people find that? it magically. <laughs> yeah, we we shared on my social media just today an article that I wrote four or five years ago, and someone put and somebody was like, "Oh, Eric, that's a great article that you just wrote on Ink." And I'm like, "No, I wrote it five years ago. You just cared about it today. Like it yeah. only mattered to you today." And so, the more evergreen your content is, the more reusable. Keep bringing that baby back. You got to do it through yeah. social. You got to keep those social channels fed, but you don't always have to like continuously create new content you do to make the Googles happy. And if you show that you're getting traffic through, which social helps with, then you're going to continue to rank, but don't forget that content. Right. And yeah. if it's not working, get rid of it. Like we pay attention to the long burn on a piece of content. And if it's not yes. it's performing over time, it's just junk. It's like yeah. that. Taking up space. It's like my side of the desk. I never sit at my desk to work. And so I got all this junk mail up and I need to just go through and throw it all away. Right. So <laughs> yes. Making sure you're promoting that content in an effective way because you're what you're doing is trying to draw people in, right? So like they're yeah. drawing in from the content to the website to then understanding your brand. And that's the point at which you're going to get them to eventually pick up the phone and convert. Yeah. And a lot of my clients panic when I tell them, you know, the, ideally, you know, a daily blog post is going to be the most, the best option, you know, when it comes to Google and, and helping improve your, your web page ranking. If that seems unreasonable, let's try at least once a week. Let's start there, work our way up. And that's still a little mind boggling for some people. And I'm like, well, let's practice batching content. You know, you don't have to write a blog every month, take maybe a day or two and write four blogs for the entire month and schedule them out. And 
that's where I get them to calm down a little bit. Like, okay, I can manage that. <laughs> yeah, and batching is so smart. That's that yeah. you really, if you can get into the workflow of doing one thing for a day, like either writing or I run my podcast and I'll do five or six interviews in a day. Yeah. And it's just, I'm giving away a day versus starting yep. and stopping a thing in the middle. And it's often easily gets run over too. Like if you're like, oh, I've got this little one hour podcast in the middle of an already busy day, it's very likely it'll get, rescheduled or changed mm-hmm. if I go, this is mm-hmm. my podcast day for the month if you'll just leave yep. this day alone that i can put all kinds of things into that day and it's much less likely to to get taken out so that's yes. not number five by the yep. way but that you know kind of leans into number four so. uh, i was hoping i was leading into number five so let's go ahead and jump <laughs> to number five then. well number five is sort of a, okay so it's complimentary so complimentary okay. is like taking advantage of other people's reach and audiences uh, yeah and so yes. which is what you and i are doing so you and i are both taking advantage of the fact that we both have networks that are not connected and because yeah. you and I are sharing content, so we're both co-creating a piece of content, which makes it 50% easier because you're saying some things and I'm saying some things that you yeah. and I will both be able to go and take this piece of content and use it on our networks, turn it into a blog, break it up into clips. So that is, and it, it becomes, now you and I know each other too. Like this is a yeah. great way for us to have connected, to learn about each other, to know how we could like transfer business to each other. So once you've got it kind of working for yourself, how can you do some, you know, the next reach out to someone that could also then be complimentary to what you're doing. You could learn something from, and yeah. you're teasing things out of me that I never would say on my own. Right. And I'm talking to you about things that you might not have think to say because yep. I'm finding those things interesting. So that fifth is that accelerant. So yeah. that's a mistake I see companies not doing a lot where, and it is a combination sometimes too, of not putting a thought leader out. So they like want the brand to do all the talking no one wants to hear from your brand. They want to hear from yeah. the individuals running the company. And so putting them out, letting them tell their story, then pulls them into your own personal content, pulls them to your you know, website. Like it's just all the way across. So I talk about this in like circles, like how are you building those circles out? And then people come in this way. They don't start at your website and move out. They start from the out and come in through the spider web. So what does yeah. that spider web look like? And make sure that you're adding to it on a daily basis. And that's basically net for you know for small businesses B two B business especially it's networking and making those connections in different chambers that you're a part of networking organizations you're tra- you're part of just making those conversations so can you give some quick examples of collaborations or partnerships out there that people may not be thinking of. Chambers is a good one. Um, there's also like here in Atlanta, we have like a technology association of Georgia. And I always talk about going where your customer is, not where you're, for, you know, like your market. Like I don't go to marketing conferences. Yeah. I don't. Exactly. I go to like, we, we sell into financial services, insurance, um, med tech, and some SaaS technology. So I go to like what can sometimes be very boring conferences. I went to a conference <laughs> about bank automation. And literally for two days, they talked about automating bank processes. <laughs> and we were doing this like round tables. So I was like, please don't ask me any questions. I don't have anything to say. But those are the people who are looking for marketing, right? They're my clients. Yep. So I go hang out where my clients hang out. I don't go hang out where other marketers are. Nice. I know where they are. We talk to each other all the time, right? Yeah. And so how do you find those environments so that you are the unique one in the room, not one of many? Uh, good point. Good point. And then uh, some collaborations that I've I've made in the past is so like I I've invited an attorney to come on the show before to talk about specifically trademarking, yeah. getting you know once you've got your logo established, you've got your name established, how do you protect that? And so that was one I brought on, and we we were able to talk about other things other than trademarking. That was good for business, you know, wise business decisions when it came to legal aspects. But yeah, like. I wouldn't have thought, I would never have thought about having that person come on until somebody yeah. was like, hey, we were at a lunch and they were like, you you should have him come on and talk about branding. I'm like, why? He's an attorney. He's like, because once a branding is done, you need to protect it. I was like, oh right. yeah, let's do this. Well, and that, those conflictions, right? So like if you're, you know, storytelling, there's always like, is there a conflict? And so if there's a time mm-hmm. you can have like a healthy where it's kind of two things don't seem like they would go together. Those can be a very yeah. interesting story that people are going to pay attention to. It's different from what they're right potentially used to hearing. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, that, these are great. So can you, I know you remember them all. So can you give a quick summary of the five mistakes people make and then let people know where they can find and follow you? 
So number one, don't spend too much time building that brand, get it out there and go make some money. Or go make some money, then build a brand. Don't worry too much about that website. So like perfection in the way of progress, get the website up and running. You must feed the beast. So creating content on a consistent basis that feeds into the keywords, not the cool little keywords you think of, the ways that your clients are researching for you, right? Yes. Making sure you're sharing that content with the 80-20 rules. So 20% creation, 80% promotion across all your social media channels, anywhere that you can get it out there to get it in front of someone. And then share with people. So who can you collaborate with to create content? Because that's the way you're going to get into other people's networks. So those are the five things that you need to do where I see most companies are making a mistake and they're doing like they're doing a lot on social, but they have a terrible website and they're not building the content, right? Like all these yeah. things kind of have to go together and they're built in a process for it to run yeah. most effectively. I absolutely love it. So how can people get to know you more, follow you, hopefully work with you? So LinkedIn, so I'm all over LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter used to be my platform, but it's LinkedIn now. So if you want to find me, find me there. Uh, you can go to our website, which is ligerpartners.com. And I have ericholtzclaw.com too, if you wanted to come to that place. But it's uh, but mostly Liger Partners are on LinkedIn. All right, perfect. Well, I thank you so much for your time. I know we're running close. You've got more podcasts to work on. So I appreciate you coming here <laughs> and spending so this time with us. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. the opportunity. Appreciate it. Of course. Have a good afternoon. Thanks.